Hi everybody, my name is Brenda Gonzalez and today's topic is bilingual education. So bilingual education is more complex than what is on the surface of bilingual education programs. All efforts towards where bilingual education is today have involved sacrifices and because of this it is important for bilingual educators to understand the history behind bilingual education to better address students, understand the meaning behind programs today, and overall add value to the context of bilingual education as a whole. Upon reading Chapter 9 of Foundations of Bilingual Education and Bilingualism by Colin Baker and Wayne Wright, it is evident that bilingual education has multiple le has had multiple legal encounters, hardships, but also some victories. Before beginning, it is important to note that bilingual education can raise misconceptions because it fails to recognize that bilingual education has existed for over 5,000 years. Because bilingualism and multilingualism have been early characteristics of human societies, additionally, bilingual education should not be studied in a modern context because bilingualism is a key factor in many societies' historical roots. For example, here in the United States, in Canada, England, Sweden, and etc., bilingualism is directly associated with immigration, political movements, equality of educational opportunity, affirmative action, and melting pot. So we're going to begin with the bilingual education timeline, and we're going to go all the way back to the 18th century. So, bilingual education was not formally born in the United States until 1963, but bilingualism was praised in the 18th and 19th century up until World War I, because linguistic diversity was encouraged through religion, newspapers, and both public and private schools. Most education was in German and English. Most schools um, that taught both of the languages, they were in Ohio, Pennsylvania, Missouri, Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, Wisconsin, Texas, Cincinnati, Baltimore, Denver, and San Francisco. But as a counter in the 1750s, Benjamin Franklin encouraged an anti-German stance, and this later promoted English-only instruction. And by 1855, along with the language suppression policies of the Bureau of Indian Affairs of the 1880s, the United States' involvement in World War I resulted in hostility towards the German language and promoted monolingual English-only instruction. And by the early 20th century, many immigrants were Italian and Jew, and unfortunately, most of them were placed in English mainstream schools, and only a fortunate few were able to experience bilingual education through private schools that taught them in their native language. Usually, these were religious schools. The 20th century became a turning point for the United States because the number of immigrants coming in increased rapidly. Assimilation became a really common practice. The Nationality Act in 1906 mandated all immigrants to speak English to be granted naturalization. This is basically where everything started. In 1919, the Americanization Department of the United States Bureau of Education required, required all public and private schools to only provide education in English. In 1923, the United States Supreme Court in Mayer versus Nebraska declared that prohibiting teaching in foreign languages is unconstitutional under the 14th Amendment. In 1927, the United States Supreme Court in Farrington versus Tokushi ruled that prohibiting after school education in foreign languages is unconstitutional. It's important to note that here the Supreme Court wasn't in favor of bilingual education, but they were in favor of promoting equality. So it's important to keep that in mind. In 1954, the Supreme Court ruled in Brown versus Board of Education that segregated in education based on race is uncons unconstitutional. See what I mean? In 1958, the National Defense Education Act was passed and this promoted foreign languages in education in elementary schools, high schools, and at universities. In 1963, Cuban exiles established Coral Way Elementary School 
in Dade County in South Florida. And this was the very first registered modern dual language school in the United States. In 1964, the Civil Rights Act aided the tolerance of ethnic languages at the federal level, at least. In 1965, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act was declared, also known as the ESEA, Additionally, the Immigration and Naturalization Act was placed into action to eliminate racial criteria for admission and emphasize the goal for family unification. In 1967, the Bilingual Education Act was introduced as an amendment of the 1965 Elementary and Secondary Education Act. Title VII provided a compensatory poverty program for the educationally disadvantaged among language minorities. In 1968, Title VII of the ESEA declared that all bilingual education programs were to be seen as a part of the federal education policy and this facilitated funds. In 1970, Lowe v. Nichols addressed the, the failure to provide a program that adequately address students' linguistic needs violated equal protection. This is the violation of the clause, the 14th Amendment, and Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. This case was not accepted at the federal court, but it was accepted at the Supreme Court in 1974. And the Supreme Court ruled that equality doesn't always mean the same materials, the same instruction, or even the same teachers. And it's not the same for those that are not proficient in English. You just can't compare the two. Proceeding the case, the law remedies were established. The remedies acknowledged that students who were not English proficient needed help. This is where English as a second language, or also known as ESL, was introduced. In 1974, the reauthorization of the ESEA's Title VII provided clear definitions of bilingual education and required all the schools receiving grants to include teaching in students' native tongue to allow students to progress their learning development. Transitional bilingual education was introduced and enforced. In 1976, Keys versus School District No. 1, Denver, Colorado, established bilingual education as compatible with desegregation. In 1978, the ESEA was reauthorized and allowed dual education programs. Just as bilingual education was making progress, the Reagan administration became generally hostile towards it and openly opposed its benefits by saying that it was un-American. So, Reagan basically developed the misconception that bilingual education neglected English and he weakened the law remedies in 1980 through the law of regulations. In 1984 and 1988, there was the reauthorization of the ESEA to increase funding for English-only special instruction. In 1994, the 103rd Congress undertook a reform major, sorry, a major reform of education through the legislation entitled Goals 2000 or Educate America Act. Additionally, the ESEA was reauthorized as Improving America Schools Act or the IASA. However, this authorization favored languages as a resource stance and did little for the funding bilingual instruction. Between 1978 and 2000, the number of English learners increased from an average of 250,000 to 1.4 million. In 1998, California's Proposition 227, or better known as the English for the Children Initiative, was presented as an effort to improve English language instruction for children who needed to learn for economic and employment opportunities. Yet, this was outlawing bilingual education. Arizona and Massachusetts followed by accepting Prop Proposition 203 for Arizona and Question 2 in 2002, which for Massachusetts, and both of these were similar to Proposition 227. 
Five years later, an evaluation showed that there was no correlation between English-only instruction and superiority over bilingual education programs. In 2001, the No Child Left Behind Act was approved and signed and into law in 2002. This act classified English learners as Limited English Proficient, or LEP, and this act holds teachers, schools, and districts accountable for the academic performance and the learning development of English learners. In 2007, the ESEA was due for reauthorization, but no action was taken until 2015. So the No Child Left Behind Act was still effective along with all of its requirements. In 2009, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act was set into action, and this act included four, sorry, $44 billion in stimulus for funding education. The program Race to the Top was added as an addition to the act, and it funded $4.3 billion in competitive grants for students to pursue, sorry, for states to pursue education form reform activities. In 2010, the Common Core state standards were completed. In 2011, a concurrent but separate initiative reform began in California under the leadership of the nonprofit English language learner advocacy group named Californians Together. This promoted the opportunity to acquire a biliteracy seal as an addition to the high school diploma. This received support from the National Association of Bilingual Education and the American Council of Teachers of Foreign Languages. In 2014, Bill 1174 was drafted to allow the opportunity to overturn Proposition 227 in California. This bill was later approved in November 2016 as Proposition 58. In 2015, nearly all states have approved action plans thanks to the ESEA flexibility. And that is the end of the bilingual education timeline as of right now. But of course, bilingual education is continuously progressing, evolving, and changing. So moving forward, Escamilla further explains hot topic questions on bilingual education, such as why bilingualism, why biliteracy, what about cultural competence, and how do we change practice to maximize our children's opportunities to become bilingual and bicultural? However, these questions have been asked since bilingual education became formally established. Why bilingualism? Well, as stated by Escamilla, it is an advantage at the individual level, community level, and at the national level. At the individual level, at early developmental stages of life, an exposure to bilingualism will increase listening skills, ability to multitask, better driving skills, delay Alzheimer's disease, and overall clarity of thought process. Bilingualism does not have to be travel related for it to be a good thing. Immigrant individuals should be held at the same esteem as those who acquire a language through formal education because the same amount of skill or even better language mastery can be demonstrated through regular use of two or more languages. Consider how people speak different languages other than English worldwide, and 50% of the world is bilingual. It is fascinating to realize that if an individual can speak both Spanish and English, they can communicate with at least 80% of the entire world population. Now, in the United States, there is political pressure to declare English as the official language, and it is the only superpower that does not openly require bilingualism. So we really need to step ahead. Imagine if the United States embraced diversity of languages. We would really be unstoppable. Because of this, it is important to consider and continuously improve bilingual education. Bilingual and dual language programs are the only ones that are really preparing students for the 21st century. Bilingual education should be normalized because it is a good pedagogy. As Escamilla demonstrates the concept of a unicycle, bicycle, and a bike that has squared wheels inside of 
you know how they show the squared wheels instead of the circular ones? Racing bikes are only good to use as long as people who are designing them know what they're doing. Bilingual education is the same way because if performed correctly, education will be improved at the national level. Bilingual education is not textual. It is completely psychological and will improve critical thinking skills. This is important for all individuals at the adult level. Additionally, a second language can be influential as developing a second persona or soul. It develops a whole new form of character. As for schools, there should be a decrease in segregation within bilingual education programs and mainstream classrooms because bilingual education should be a common practice for all students and not a select few. All students should be granted the opportunity to acquire a second language. This is a life skill. Most judgment on bilingual education is based on cross-language processing, interlanguage or interference, language shift, and code switching. But according to Richard and Snow, bilingualism is not a handicap. Being able to switch between languages demonstrates active cognition development. Kaushan Kaya and Crespo explain that code switching is a common communication strategy that some bilinguals use where they switch back and forth between languages during conversations with others who speak to their two languages. Sometimes they switch languages from one sentence to the next during conversation, and sometimes they switch languages within a single sentence. Code switches within a sentence may be a single word or a larger group of words. Some bilinguals code switch regularly, while others code switch rarely, if at all. Students should never feel the need to assimilate and leave their native language to be accepted in society. Lastly, Stephen Krashen also adds value to the points stated by Escamilla. He adds a conversational language is developed with greater facilitation than learning academic language. This is why English learner students are able to communicate their needs before they're able to understand a lesson. This is part of the seven levels of language proficiency as stated by Richard and Snow. Bilingual programs are not usually focused on maintaining native roots and this is the problem. Acculturation should be promoted over assimilation. Krashen also states how students who have solidly developed a first language will acquire a second language with greater ease. So there is no need to neglect any of the two languages as Reagan would believe. Bilingual programs are not intended to teach only one language, but develop two languages at the same time. It is unfair to place English learner students in English-only classrooms because this will only cause frustration and a lack of motivation to continue with education. Students should develop English competence at a timely pace to be more effective in their language and learning development. This is backed up by the Supreme Court case that was mentioned earlier, Lao versus Nichols, and the Lao remedies. Bilingual education serves as a solution for dropout rates. Overall, bilingual education is so important to implement in all schools. Bilingual education is directly associated with a multicultural education, as James Banks would agree. Multicultural education is the glue that holds the educational system together. It is a practice that embraces all people of any disability, all colors, cultures, sexual orientations, religions, ethnic backgrounds, social class, and linguistic backgrounds. It not only exposes students to other cultures and practices, but allows the opportunity to gain a deeper understanding. Consequently, this develops an appreciation for diversity and maintaining an objective mindset. A multicultural education promotes a safe space and an all-inclusive environment for students and not only benefits minorities, but all students as a whole, because students' cultures may be evaluated through the perspective of multiple cultural groups. Without a bilingual education, students are not only limited from learning about other cultures, but are also deprived from understanding their own culture. Diversity promotes the understanding of similarities that joins us with others, as well as the beauty in what makes us different. 
Palmer states that dual language bilingual education promotes the goals of bilingualism, biliteracy, high academic achievement, and cross-cultural competence. Additionally, a bilingual education promotes the values of kindness, empathy, and respect.